And Dan, a uh, longtime politically active Oaklander and uh, East Bay guy and uh, Skyline guy, actually Skyline High. But, you know, he has a story to tell that places right, him but, at know, the center. He has a story to tell that places him at the center. And, and, and places him at the center, at the center of the whole legalization of marijuana matter in Oakland. And it's it's fascinating. Um, it's uh, it's sad. And he's still fighting it against the federal government. And, and without any further ado, uh, from me, it, tell your story. But for those of who come on coming on to live stream, folks, if you have any questions, just type them in the chat, and I'll see them uh, right here. And I'll ask them. We're going to be on for about uh, from now until 8:40 Central Standard uh, Time, or 8:45. Dan, how hey, you doing? Sa- thanks, Danny, and uh, it's good to talk to you, buddy. And I'm more of a Dewey continuation high guy than I am a skyline high. <laughs> you got it. Um, but I, I had my moment there, and it was great. I'll never forget it. So uh, it was long about, uh, it was actually the Thanksgiving weekend of 2009, and I was the special operations director for UFCW Local 5, which is actually was an unpaid position. It's something I did for free. Because I loved my local and I loved the labor movement. I'm actually a licensed private investigator. And that's how I've always made my money. And the union loved me, so they would give me... I was a member, and they would give me jobs and titles. And and uh, and I had a lot of, a lot of leeway there. And, and nobody ever really knew the reality. Uh, because I was a political animal, and I created this special operations department so that it could work on statewide political matters like statewide ballot initiatives. So as all political hacks do on the Thanksgiving weekend, we all run home on Wednesday night and uh, go home with the family, and we try to act like good family people, but we're usually all type A personalities, so we only get (laughs) home on Thanksgiving. And that's so we can cruise the Internet um, with a plate of turkey and, and our families and go over what the upcoming ballot initiatives are going to be. And so uh, I always looked for ballot initiatives because I was a statewide guy. Uh, I looked for ballot initiatives that were going to help our members or hurt our members was the number one priority. And then number two was social causes that uh, that helped society and social justice and, uh, and equity, social equity and economic equity and all the things that we've all been fighting for 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 a lifetime. So this one Thanksgiving weekend, I'm I'm looking uh, through the initiatives that have just been filed with the Secretary of State's office, and I bump into all these cannabis legalization initiatives. I think there's like four of them. Um, And one of them turned out to be Prop 19. So, and I actually, when I was bumping into him, because I'm a clean and sober guy, I've, I've been in AA and NA for going back to 2002, so I hadn't even really thought about smoking a joint since 2002. Mm-hmm. And uh, so here I find cannabis initiative, and then I got to go through more stuff, and here's a cannabis initiative, and, and I'm thinking, God, these cannabis hippies, they're just relentless. They filed all these things. And... Uh, so one of them has an address, 1600 Broadway. And so 1601 Broadway used to be the address for UFCW, uh, for the Retail Clerks Union, uh, which later became UFCW Local 5. And I knew the address well. So I, uh, it struck me. And as soon as I saw that address, this whole uh, lightning bolt of realization happened. Suddenly, I realized this economic revitalization I've been watching in downtown Oakland. Glass going back in windows, uh, utilities going back on in abandoned buildings, the hustle and bustle of work. uh, Just this whole economic revitalization in downtown Oakland. And it came to me, well, that's what this is. And then I I remembered hearing about Oaksterdam. And I remembered hearing about the ordinances and Mayor Brown and Jerry was the mayor and trying to work things out. And I remember Measure Z all at once. So what that did was this gave me this vision of cannabis um, being an economic revitalizer. And it's something that nobody could have explained to me. It had
had to be a result of this sudden vision of driving through downtown Oakland for 10 years and watching this revitalization happen and seeing the result and not knowing it was cannabis and then suddenly realizing it was cannabis. So uh, I'm kind of a mission from God guy. And so I got struck with my bolt uh, from God and I, I got my mission and that was to go out and organize cannabis workers. That was to go out and build my union because I figured there were 500,000 people in the country that are making a living doing, at the time, doing black market cannabis and, and gray market cannabis. And I thought, well, what if we pull all those people out of the garages and the warehouses and off the street corners and put them in licensed dispensaries and cultivation facilities? So, as you, everybody knows in Oakland, I'm an old outlaw motorcycle rider in Oakland. And so, the next morning, I jumped on my motorcycle and I rode down to uh, what was Oaksterdam, Prop 19 headquarters. And I found this room filled with young, bustling political hacks and people. And I thought, man, these guys might have a chance. So a few more meetings, met Richard Lee, met Dale. Uh, and we kind of set out to sort of mutually organize the industry, the workers at Oaksterdam, and also to bring in mainstream political support from the union, from unions, from mainstream. Uh, I went to the Democratic Party. I got the first ever uh, resolution and Democratic Party platform that called for a unionized cannabis industry, assisting and developing. And uh, I, I went to every union in the world. I got the support of SEIU for Prop 19 largest union in, in uh, North America, got the support of UFCW, the largest private sector union in North America, um, and other stuff. So what ended, up, what ended up happening was we built this mainstream coalition. Um, it was something that I was never really expecting to do. and But it all sort of came together, and as it came together, it became my life's work. So in the process of that, I got the attention of Melinda Haig, who was the U.S. attorney at the time, and everybody knows her as the reefer madness queen and, and uh, a U.S. attorney that was just dedicated to uh, annihilating cannabis. Frankly, I've always thought because she came out of the pharmaceutical industry, and I believe she's gone back to the pharmaceutical industry. Um, so she began investigating me. And... Um, you know what's funny is the feds came after me for five years. They investigated me. They had undercover operators, uh, undercover agents. They had paid informants. They had arrested people around us and turned them into informants against me. They went through this whole charade trying to find some way to take me apart because as Melinda Haig ran around the state and said, reefer madness, and I'm going to stop cannabis, I ran around the country and said, cannabis control, tax, regulate, taxation, infrastructure, public, public safety and health, create jobs, um, you know, get rid of the drug cartels. And uh, so frankly, I won that debate, that very pu uh, public debate between Melinda Haig and I, the U.S. Attorney. She really didn't like it. And... Uh, so anyway, the other thing, so now I'm on my way to Terminal Island uh, Federal Penitentiary. I've been sentenced to three years. I pled guilty to conspiracy to money laundering. Um, and I'm not going to try to lessen the crimes at this point. I'll, I'll explain them in a minute. Uh, I pled guilty to accepting illegal payments as a union leader. Uh, and then something about my email, using my email to further a, cr a federal crime. So... Um, the conspiracy to money launder was my lawyer and um, this person that served as a immunized informant against me got together and my lawyer ended up depositing money in a way that they call structure. I didn't even know. But three months later, he told me in a conversation he had performed these acts. So because I didn't pick up the phone and call the FBI and turn him in, um, and he's my lawyer, right? So I'm, ex I'm 
depending on him to give me legal advice. Yeah. And so if I thought somebody was doing something illegal, I would ask him. And he assures me, oh, there's no problem. It's, uh, I'm just cutting out some paperwork. Um, Couldn't you so sue him? Because I didn't turn him in when he told me casually in a conversation three months later, which I told him, hey, I don't want to, I don't, don't tell, I don't even, you know, I don't understand, I don't want to know. So when I didn't turn him in, that became conspiracy to money launder. The government characterized it as I had ordered him to go out and launder money. Um, this thing about receiving illegal payments, this very same guy, this lawyer, also my lawyer, my 15 year friend owed me hundreds of thousands of dollars as a licensed private investigator who had been working on his files. And also I had taken out a, a nearly $500,000 loan on my property to, um, finance him building a law firm so that we could be the lawyer and investigator of Oakland. And uh, so he reluctantly figured out a way to, to create crimes in taking care of this stuff and, and explain them to me as my lawyer. And I'm thinking, we're okay. This guy's a lawyer. He's the guy. If, if I have questions, I'm supposed to ask him. Um, after I went to work for the International Union in Washington, D.C., I took a $250,000 a year pay cut. I couldn't run my investigations for a minute. So um, I'm literally looking to every source I have that owes me money so I can keep going, keep the campaign going, um, and not miss a beat. I go back and tell this guy, you have to pay me the money you owe me, that you owe me, mm -hmm. that you've owed me for 15 years, but years, be for 10 years, years before I ever organized the cannabis work. Part of that repayment was that he got me a credit card. I made him get me a credit card because he ruined my credit. Hmm. And I'm traveling the country and I can't use union credit cards for anything but specific stuff. So um, I make him give me a credit card for $2,000 a month so I have a card to travel with. And so it's sort of a, it's an interest payment on the money he owes my firm for the professional work that we did for him. Well, that became illegal payments because hmm. At one point, he became a lawyer in the industry. He began representing cannabis companies, and I was the cannabis union director. So because any money went from his hand to my hand, that's illegal. Now, I kind of knew that at the time, but I didn't consider that getting loan payments from somebody who's owed me money, and especially before cannabis, I just really didn't think twice about it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but the fact of the matter is when he was an industry, when he became an industry lawyer and he, he handed me money, even though he owed it to me, um, that payment was illegal. Hmm. So I pled guilty to that. I pled guilty to the, uh, conspiracy for money laundering because I didn't pick up the phone and call the FBI. And frankly, I would never have, I don't, that's not how I live. It's not how I operate. It's not my job to make sure that everybody that's committed a crime gets delivered to the FBI. If I have to ask, even though your attorney wasn't acting in your defense, he sounded like he was acting against you. He became a, a paid and immunized... Well, no, they, they prosecuted him. They cut him a deal. He became a witness for the government against me. He wore wires on me. He made sure that my, my rental cars were bugged, my hotel rooms were bugged. He walked in and carried scripts and read them to me as my attorney, telling me that that I needed to do certain things that were actually fabricated crimes that would actually be a crime that the FBI was fabricating to try to get him to trick me into. Um, they spent five years trying to get me to, to say that I would take... Uh, that I would appreciate if somebody restructured an investment, but they kept calling it a loan. And so they had written a script that said, Dan Rush took a bribe for um, being, uh, for loan forgiveness. Well, the money was never a loan. It was an investment in a, a development that I was doing on my property in Oakland 
on my family's property, we were going to build an assisted living care center. When I borrowed the $400,000 to help my lawyer, his way of repaying the loan, because he was supposed to repay the loan. See, he, his credit was ruined. He came to me and said, you know, my credit's ruined. Can you take money out on your, on your property and we'll build this? Actually, he said, I want to build a firm. And I said, I'll get the loan. Then he drug his feet about paying it back. But the, the deal was, I take out the loan. I make it so that we can support ourselves and build this firm. And then he is supposed to pay it back. And that's, you know, a very reasonable deal. So, um, but he got into this whole thing where cannabis growers had cash and it was this money laundering thing. And, you know, I knew glimpses and pieces of what was going on, but they were being characterized to me by my lawyer as he had, he knew what he was doing hmm. and that he, you know, that everything we were doing was okay. So I'm walking around thinking my lawyer has said it's okay. I'm thinking I'm cool. So, um, so I fought the government, their case for two and a half years. And I had to, you know, I, it took everything that my family could beg, borrow, and steal to, to maintain that fight for over two years. It's hard to fight. The Justice Department in court, and especially when they just levy all of their resources on you, and their resources and their and their their diatribe are lies that they come up with because these people are the greatest con group in the world. So what was these very innocent things that I was doing? And I got to tell you, I'm no school kid. I mean, I, I'm no church mouse. I, I grew up in East Oakland. I'm from the flats. I'm a guy that will kick your ass before I'll call the cops. I'm a guy that will take care of my neighborhood because I know the cops won't come to it to begin with. And I don't, you know, I'm not trying to say I'm some church mouse over here. I'm just saying I'm not a criminal. And the way that the federal government characterized me was to be this 24-hour day, seven-day-a-week sociopath who had somehow landed in positions I was in because of nepotism. They claimed that anything I did in the union was a result of my dad was this big union leader. Hmm. My dad was a teamster and a local union leader. My union is U was UFCW until they worked with the government to get rid of me too, which was some internal political problems. So, um, they had characterized me as this lazy, greedy, pocket-lining sociopath who sits around all day long and smokes cigars and demands that people give me this and pay me off for that. And nothing I've ever done, I've never done a good thing that my mother didn't like. I mean, Jeez. and then when, when they come after you, they hit you in the media. They try you in the media. They put out these press releases. I got to tell you, they, they've got brilliant um, communications people. Mm -hmm. And so they hit me with these press releases that just vilified me. And I got to tell you, it was hard. And I was sick. I, you know, I, I've been losing limbs uh, to, uh, to a bacterial disease called MRSA. Mm. Been on a five-year campaign mm. that was a national, it was a North American campaign that all over the continent working on marijuana legalization and and working on every state that we see now uh, I was one of the first people to land in, in Denver when uh, mm -hmm. when we began drafting what is now known as amendment 64 I was one of the first people in Nevada when uh, the drafting of uh, question 2 was being prepared for the ballot initiative 502 in Washington State mm -hmm. I uh, was out. I was with Alice and the ACLU there from from day one. Uh, two questions, um, since we're kind of getting toward uh, the end of our time, but I have to ask you, where, what's next for you, in terms of you, you know, the comeback, because you went through well, hell. Okay, so uh, for two years, two and a half years, my lawyers, who are excellent lawyers told me, anything you say publicly will be used against us. If you say you want to feed the hungry, 
they'll say that you have some criminal scheme about how to come up with some scam that makes it look like you're feeding, you're feeding the hungry. And they were right. <laughs> I mean, they were. Jeez. So I, uh, for two years, I had to sit back. Once in a while, I would lose my mind and go on Facebook and write stuff. Um, but essentially, I had to mm -hmm. turn down. When I got, when they indicted me, my phone and email lit up for months. You know, mainstream media. They wanted to talk to me. They wanted to hear from me. Mm -hmm. um, and my lawyers told me, no, if you do that, we won't represent you. And uh, they're good lawyers. So I just climbed in this cocoon and I never said anything. We finally got to the point where it was um, the last punitive thing that the courts could do to me would be to impose a punitive sentence on me for what I pled guilty to. And I pled guilty to crimes I committed, mm -hmm. unusual circumstances, not that I'm a criminal. Sometimes you go over the speed limit, sometimes you go under the speed limit because life situations call for that. Was this a case of you not knowing what, that there was a speed limit at all? Did you did in other words you didn't know that I didn't even, in the money laundering thing I didn't even know we were in a car. Mm -hmm. My lawyer took money from a from a pot grow from a cannabis grower. And but I'm saying you didn't know what you were money laundering, right? I wasn't money laundering. Right, that's what I'm getting was. at. Okay, yeah. But I prosecuted for it because casually in a conversation three months later, he tells me he had done some money laundering, but he didn't say I laundered money. He mm -hmm. he gave me this really cryptic version of uh, I saved us some time and money. Mm -hmm. And so I'm a smart enough guy. I've been a licensed private investigator for 30 years this year. I kind of knew that there were components there. But I, you know, I just didn't know. I didn't know <laughs> what he was doing. And so he commits a crime, I get prosecuted for it. Hmm. Um, you know, so, but I pled guilty to it. And I, you know what? I'm a big boy. So I know that when I accept responsibilities for things, I have responsibilities for them, whether or not, by omission or commission. I'm responsible for what happens, and the buck stops with me. Now so, that I get that ask, now that marijuana is legal in California, does this make your situation better? Uh, no. As a matter of fact, it's heartbreaking for me to know that all the work I did and. Uh, and when my name pops up, typically I my name pops up as the scoundrel, hmm. as the guy that uh, lined his own pockets and served his own interests in spite of the good work that was going on. So it's it's heart heartbreaking for me to think that people do that. People think that about me. Hmm. And now that I'm been sentenced, now I can talk. They've mm -hmm. imposed the sentence. It is what it is, and. Uh, so now I'm going to tell my story. It broke my heart to not be standing in front of dispensaries on New Year's Eve and, and celebrating and shaking people's hands. It was, it was heartbreaking. But uh, at that point, I couldn't talk. It's only been the last few days that I can actually talk. So now what's happening is um, my story's being worked on. There are professionals working on it. Uh, and it's it's being worked on from a multimedia perspective, but let's just call it I'm writing a book and somebody's making a documentary. Mm -hmm. um, I have to be really careful about how I talk about that because I've signed agreements that say I won't talk about certain things mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with uh, with my yeah, and I have an agent, mm -hmm. I, ha I have a publisher, um, and I have a. Uh, I have a film producer who is renowned in, in this century for uh, two films that he made. And now you have this. Let me ask you a question, because uh, this is also a video on demand and not just a live stream. So once we're done, it's going to be up here forever, um, okay. you know, unless you tell me to take it down. But um, <laughs> but what what advice do you have now? for Oaklanders in this new, quote, legal, unquote, environment? What should they do? What should they watch out for? Because for me, I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not being, I'm just being honest. I'm not a, I'm there, I've only had marijuana four times in my life, and that was like, you know, college, and never got high, right? 
So, and but your mom, and your mom caught you three times, right? No, 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 not at all. It wasn't even that. I just, you know, everybody has their thing that just wasn't mine. Then, you know, nothing against anybody who does. Just emphasizing that when I'm, I have to be candid and say what I'm delighted of to know is that there's this decriminalization because so many black folks have been, you know, unfairly treated, as you know. You know. African Americans have been completely left out of the industry, and it was one of the things that I found to be the most appalling. Mm -hmm. the community that I went to the hardest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you worked hard on it's, it. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. still. Um, anyway, what what advice do you have for people in Oakland? Because well, also, see, you know, also with travel, like I travel a lot, and so there are places that are still it's a it's a complicated log jam. And to me, I'm thinking, golly, you know, why would you want to get involved now? You travel to another state, and then you're in trouble again, and all this stuff, you know. So let me t let me speak to the industry and the vendors first. Sure. And I'm going to be kind, Zini, and not mention specific names because you're an Oaklander. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I know everybody. So <laughs> I don't want you to suffer from from uh, from what I have to say. Sure. And and the reality of it is, people do suffer from what I have to say, and I keep that in mind. Mm-hmm. But to the vendors in the new industry, don't go thinking that because you're licensed by the state of California that you're okay. There are currently, in the dozens, paid and immunized informants that work for the FBI hmm. that turn over everything that they get. And it's not that they do it because they want to. They have to do it. Mm -hmm. They have to do it because they're immunized by the uh, by the Justice Department, by the U.S. attorneys. They're given something called an otherwise illegal activity license. And they're also people who have pled guilty to crimes already. And if, if the prosecutors feel that they're not doing what they want them to do, then the prosecutors will uh, nullify the contract that they have with these folks. And so what that means is, you know, if you know somebody that's that is a current uh, FBI operative, and you think that they're not going to do anything to you because you're friends, let me just tell you, they don't have a choice in the matter. They do not have a choice in the matter. If the U.S. attorneys say go after that person, they have to go after you, and they have to prove to those U.S. attorneys and the FBI that they're doing everything they can. Wow. They're active in Oakland. Oakland is sort of like the Jerusalem of uh, the cannabis industry. Hmm. Uh, um, Humboldt County being the Bethlehem, the hmm. town of David, so to speak, if you want to speak biblically. There are people in the industry, and we're watching um, Attorney General Sessions mm -hmm. talking about going after uh, cannabis people. And he wants to fill the prisons, right. which he has tens of thousands of stock certificates in that are being held in escrow because he had to put him in escrow because he's the attorney general. Mm. But the more those prisons get filled, the more valuable his stocks get. Mm. He's ordering his U.S. attorneys to start prosecuting legal cannabis people. And he focuses on legal because he didn't know it in the beginning, but there's the Hinchy Far Rohrbacker Amendment in the 2016 and 17 federal budgets. Mm -hmm. Those preclude the Justice Department from going after cannabis people in cannabis states that have a, an appropriate agency, hmm. an agency of my design. And that was always what I put into these policy documents, in, into these initiatives and legislation and policy was this, this agency. So um, folks got to realize that Sessions wants to fill his jails, make some money, and he's a crackpot. And I, I got to tell you, I'm on a ledge here now because I'm going to a federal prison that he, his department presides over. And you're going on a week from tomorrow? Yeah, I'm turning myself into Terminal Island, which is a federal penitentiary in uh, Los Angeles County just off the shore of Long Beach. Mm -hmm. And uh, on my Facebook... Minimum and my security? Other minimum security? I'm going to be in a minimum security portion of this penitentiary. That's good. Yeah. And hopefully I'll be moved to what, what they call a club fed or a camp for old guys like me that aren't going to prison for violence and other, you know, uh, scary stuff. Mm -hmm. I should be going to a camp, but 
Um, I'm an old guy and I got medical problems, so they're going to send me to this hospital in Terminal Island. I'll get reviewed there, and then hopefully I'll get shipped up to Oregon. And then I'll be close to my family. I don't live in Oakland anymore. Mm -hmm. And I'm the guy that people would have bet would never have left Oakland, including myself. But Pam and I, we, we got to a point where we needed to get away, and I needed to focus on writing my book. Uh, it's actually, there are going to be three books. And, uh, and I'm not a really good writer, so I write gar garbledy goop, and then the editors come back two months later and say, well, here's some you know, actual English, English language. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm going to be working on that stuff, and hopefully I'll be home in 13 months, 14 yeah. months. Uh, it's a three-year sentence, but I qualify for programs mm -hmm. uh, for early release. And, uh, I'm, you know, I got to tell you, I'm walking into prison with my chin up and my chest out. I haven't done anything that I wouldn't have done in front of God. Hmm. There were some technical mm -hmm. violations of federal law, so I'm a big boy and I have to answer for my actions. And um, that's just part of life. And, uh, frankly, I'm, I'm proud to do that. I'm not going to be happy hanging around in federal prison, but I don't mind going. I don't mind answering for what I've done. And that's something I'll always do. And, and it's something that the government really was successful in the media mm -hmm. in, in just dragging me through the mud and turning me into this, this pig. They, they turned me into this horrible, pocket-lining, sociopathic pig that's never done a decent thing in my life. And thank God that there are, you know, I come from the same place I've been my entire life and five generations before me. Mm -hmm. I know everybody, though, and I, I come from movements that are yeah. sincere. I look at you as a Democrat, because I met you at the, uh, remember the, with uh, Pamela Drake, I think, introduced us at the, you, uh, yeah. Uh, you at, were the only one that wrote a positive article about me, because there was some stuff being written in my, uh, in my uh, uh, candidacy for the 14th Assembly District <laughs> uh, for executive board. Because I had been an e-board member in another district, but they moved the district, so I had to run in the new district as a new guy. And you came, and I was under attack at the time because, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's easy to demonize me. I'm kind of a caveman, I'm kind of an old-fashioned square guy. I'm Whoopi Goldberg in a Ben Davis shirt. <laughs> but, I, but I'm a Democrat reformer. I'm a pro-gun Democrat. I... Uh, I uh, think that, uh, that the Democrats, we've just gone too far into uh, people's uh, lives, and, and it's invasive. And people are objecting to it. Now they're doing things like hire, uh, electing Donald Trumps and Jeff Sessions and these other wingnut uh, conservatives <laughs> that are just... You know, oh, hold on a second. I think, I think one of my viewers has a question. He says, uh, is any before the stream, he has a... Uh, he has a Okay, I'll I'll take that question. That's off topic, Barry Ely. I'll take that another time. Hey, Dan, um, it's eight forty nine, so we're a little over time, but uh, it was valuable. And don't stick around. I wanna I wanna um, just talk to you off camera, but I wanna make sure. Is are you are are you still are you on Twitter still? Can you still do social media when you go in and everything or? No, I can't do that. I have some slight email about 30 minutes a month, and it's really restricted. Mm -hmm. I can communicate with my family by email. Uh, it's it's almost not worth mentioning. Gotcha. Uh, there are folks who run my Facebook pages, mm -hmm. and, there's, and that's Dan Rush, and then the Friends of Dan Rush, which is a private page, uh, that if you send me a, a request, I'm probably going to approve, because I don't have anything I'm hiding. I just don't like the, the internet garbage. That, sure. I don't like it when people advertise sunglasses on my friend's page. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> and then I have Dan Rush, uh, Daniel J. Rush and Associates, uh, Government Affairs Consulting Incorporated, that page. And so my pages will be filled with information and updates, and uh, people will be watching them, and uh, contact stuff. And, and I hope people do stay friends and I'm out of room on my Dan Rush Facebook page I have 5,000 friends there but uh, the other pages and especially Dan Rush uh, consulting mm -hmm. 
government affairs. So, uh, and please look at the videos that are being done and because now we're telling my story. Mm -hmm. Now is the time to tell the story and I gotta tell you, we're telling the story. The only thing we're not putting in is what has been sealed by the court. Uh, and frankly, I fought to keep it all unsealed. Gotcha. But okay. unfortunately, they're gonna protect their rats. I mean, witnesses. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Dan, I'll talk to you off camera. Thanks a lot. And Thank you, uh, God bless you, man. And uh, keep oh. your head up, and we're we are around you. We got your back, so no, no worries. You know. Thank you, brother. All right, man. I'll talk to you. Don't go anywhere. Okay, see ya. Okay. And folks, uh, make sure you subscribe to Zenny Sixty Two on YouTube, and uh, we'll see you.